Okay, this is the uh, brief video lecture on pop culture. Um, start with talking about functionalism because the the kid article um, and the web disc one of the web discussions is about the functions of of pop culture and so it's kind of important to get an idea of what functionalism is. Um, it or has its origins in Marx and Durkheim, which we read. Um, so the example is Marx famously talked about religion as the opiate of the masses, and what he meant by that, as we've already talked about a lot, is uh, that religion functioned to sort of placate the masses, to keep them satisfied for this system of capitalism, okay? And uh, so functionalist arguments, whenever you're making a functionalist argument, you're always making assumptions, and usually those assumptions can't be proven and so this can be, it doesn't have to be, if you recognize it, it doesn't have to be a fallacy, but in philosophy, in formal logic, um, functionalism is, is associated with a particular fallacy called begging the question. That just means that you kind of assume something to begin with, and then you proceed with the argument on the basis of that assumption, and then it turns out that you, what, it, what you think you proved in the argument is something you just assumed from the beginning, okay? And so there's debate among um, philosophers and, and social scientists who study science about whether or not uh, this can be a scientific thing if you can't prove it. So that's one of the main critiques of Marxism is that it's not scientific because you can never prove it because he just sort of assumes that all of these social institutions like religion um, function in a particular way, but he's kind of assuming this capital system to begin with. Okay, so um, we'll talk about how Kid does that specifically in a second, um, but the main point is just that functionalist thinking can be a powerful way to think about the world. If you think about how these um, ideas, these, these pop culture images function to um, make us think particular ways, make us act particular ways, that can be a very empowering thing to open our eyes to what is going on, but we just have to recognize that it can be fallacious if we're not careful. So that's the only um, thing to begin. Uh, okay, so in the kid article, um, he's talking about the functions of Harry Potter. Okay, so we're talking about a particular piece of pop culture, um, but obviously the idea here would be to generalize this to other um, objects of culture, other pieces of pop, pop culture as well. Um, and so he, he talks about a few different things. Um, social boundaries, uh, he even mentions the Bryson um, reading, the Bethany Bryson reading from last week, and talks about um, so reception of culture as this way to create social boundaries. Um, and uh, I think interestingly though he kind of misses the point of Bryson later that I'll talk about in a second um, he also talks about these rituals of pop culture and that's what one of the web discussions is about um, so here he, the, he doesn't really talk too much about Durkheim but the, um, the web discussion is to think about these rituals surrounding the consumption of pop culture in a Durkheimian way and think about how it creates these experiences of collective effervescence. So what he talks about is like these mass, when the books come out and you know people are lined up outside the door and that that's, um, that's in its own way this kind of ritual where people are gathered around, he doesn't really use this ter the term, the Durkheimian terms, where people are gathered around the totem of these Harry Potter stories and symbols um, and it creates this sense of community among, among people. Um, so he also talks a lot about pop culture and change and he doesn't mention Schutzen, but the Schutzen article that we read and we wrote about um, thinking about cultural objects. So Schutzen, so just as a reminder, Schutzen talked about the cultural, I mean, the efficacy of cultural objects. And what he meant by that was to, to, to think about how, um, well, he, he basically says that most cultural objects do not create change, okay, but, or, or, um, or causal in the way that they um, bring about society or social organization. But then he does list these different ways 
um, these different dimensions of cultural of efficacy that the more powerful they are on these different dimensions the more they have potential to to actually be causal and to maybe to, to bring about some kind of change other than just reproducing the same ideas and um, structural institutions and cultural ideas um, so I think that that's an important thing to think about is that most of the time I mean if you can kind of the practical takeaway in terms of something you can actually apply to your own life is that most of the time we're consuming pop culture the ideas that we're being fed are actually just reinforcing a particular set of values that you know some other institution benefits from us believing in um, that's not always the case but that is usually the case so it's important in when consuming pop culture to um, be critical and to be thinking about that um, okay so um, on this last bullet point Harry Potter is a source of norms um, he talks about more in terms of the practice surrounding the book, like who reads it and things like that. And uh, this is where I think that he sort of m misses the Bryson point. The main point from Bryson is that um, omnivore culture, people who um, consume all different kinds of culture, they consume highbrow and lowbrow culture. That actually is a source of cultural power and cultural capital. Okay, But then in this article, Kidd talks about um, this line between legitimate versus illegitimate culture. So he talks about how like the schools were, were um, not assigning Harry Potter and like don't recognize it as legitimate culture, but yet it's consumed on this mass level. And uh, what I would actually argue that on that point, in, sort of in contrast to Kid, is that I actually think that there's something else going on. Like I think that a lot of cultural critics um, are sort of louding and complimenting the Harry Potter series um, but it's in this sort of like highbrow way okay so the same way that um, both Bourdieu that Bourdieu talks about um, when people when people from a highbrow culture are um, consuming or receiving what's considered lowbrow culture um, they're doing it in a different way than maybe the class group that that culture is intended for okay so the example that I gave in a different lecture was um, about how before bluegrass bluegrass used to be thought bluegrass used to be thought of as this kind of like lowbrow thing but then um, people started you know you had this phenomenon of, of um, high culture people you know people from upper and upper middle classes can going to these bluegrass concerts but the way that they consume that culture is different because they're because of their uh, distance from necessity, they're capable of of uh, receiving that culture in a different way. Okay, of, of stressing form over function is the main is kind of the thing there. So I actually think that even though it is an important line that Harry Potter is exemplifies this sort of battle over what's legitimate versus illegitimate culture, I actually think that most critics who are um, who praise the Harry Potter series and who praise J.K. Rowling do so in this sort of like highbrow way of consuming lowbrow culture. And so I think that's kind of an important thing to think about that um, Kid misses. Um, and uh, he also talks about the boundary that it creates among religious persons. So, you know, a lot of Christian groups came out saying that Harry Potter is evil because it's talking about magic and magic is evil. And what's interesting about that, I think, is that thinking about the actual content of Harry Potter, I mean, hope, I, I'm kind of assuming that most people are basically familiar with it, at least seeing some of the movies or something, but um, it's actually very, in, in the structure of the story, it's very much follows this uh, sort of like Christ archetype, okay? I don't mean that the book is Christian, obviously it's not, a, has nothing to do with Jesus, but that Harry Potter is a Christ figure in the sense that the, the, the content of the story and the role that he's playing and that he's trying to save people, he's trying to represent the good, it very much represents this particular narrative and this particular way of thinking about the world that is actually very Christian. Um, and so in that sense, thinking about it functionally, it actually serves as, you know, as a conservative function 
um, in the way that it reproduces the set of values that we already sort of have in our culture because of the Christian um, sort of roots of Western culture. And um, so the, the, I guess, irony, and I don't think Kid missed this, this wasn't his point really, but the irony, thinking about Harry Potter as an as a object of pop culture, is that Christians that sort of hate this, this book, um, it's, it's ironic that they do, given the um, ultimately culturally conservative nature of the story here. And um, the, the one thing I, other thing I wanted to mention here was that he doesn't... So one of the main things that I've read in terms of like s social scientific analysis of Harry Potter and the reception of Harry Potter is the gender element. Um, so there's a lot of feminist critique about Harry Potter, basically claiming that Harry Potter is very reproductive, that Hermione is empowered in her own way, the character Hermione, who's a female character in the book for those not familiar, um, but that it's it's in a very gendered, sort of stereotypically gendered way. So again, I mean, thinking about function, um, it's that's the thing to be thinking about is how, in terms of, you could come up with different examples from different pieces of culture, but in this one, there's a, there's a lot going on functionally around gender and gender roles and gender norms. And uh, so, um, okay, those are some of the things to think about. Um, yeah, that should be enough for the, for the web discussions on there. Okay, so the Van Zunen article, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, I hope I am, but um, but uh, this is what the quiz is on, and um, this article is also very much about reception of culture, and so it's a sort of a continuation of, of our last week's discussion. Um, but she's talking about something specific about politics and how um, television shows and movies about politics help individuals construct what she calls your political self which is kind of like the way that people orient themselves to politics. And um, the political self is formulated through these three um, sort of mechanisms. Media discourse, obviously, that's like CNN, Fox News, like people talking about it. People's experience with politics and then popular wisdom. And But the thing that she focuses on with the, um, is the second one, experiential knowledge, because what she argues is that when people watch uh, pop culture um, depictions of politics, they are, that kind of counts for them. They end up using that as experiential knowledge. Um, she talks about other things too, but that's the thing that I kind of wanted to focus on. Um, and uh, again, this is an analysis about something particular. It's about the consumption of political shows and movies. Um, and then how that orients act, action in the political realm. But it's general, you know, we need to be thinking about the more general point, okay? That when people consume culture, it's helping them to orient their strategies of action. And that phrase, strategies of action, should be familiar because it comes from Swidler and toolkit theory. And um, this, this analyst, Van Zunen, is not a sociologist. She's actually trained as a political scientist. Um, so she doesn't reference Swidler at all. That's nothing, that's not to her discredit or anything. Um, she doesn't have to reference Swidler, but you know, and one of the quiz questions and just an important thing to think about is how this relates back to toolkit theory. And um, so, I mean, basically what she's talking about, even though she doesn't say it explicitly, is that when people consume this kind of culture about, po about politics, it becomes part of their toolkit, okay? That's the basic point. Um, it's not stated explicitly in the article, but that's really important for us to make the connection in terms of theory, sociological theory, about culture, um, is that when people consume these kinds of media, these kinds of cultural objects, it helps them formulate beliefs, uh, it sort of constructs this belief system that they're then going to use as a frame in viewing their own experience with politics and then in informing their action um, towards politics. Um, but again, that doesn't, doesn't have to just be about politics. It can be general, generalized to other 
uh, parts of life as well. So um, I think that that's all. There's two dis web discussions and a quiz. Um, and uh, I think that that covers everything. So please let me know if you have any questions and good luck with those assignments.